community and transportation action item. Assess the need for bike racks throughout the community. We do have a bike and pedestrian plan and we just did a downtown parking study which identified spots for bike racks and we've been working with a group called Citizens for Active Transportation who just received a, a Wellmart grant to purchase bike racks and install them downtown. So that's another completed action item. It's always good to acknowledge when we have those. Sure, do you know what happened with, uh, with this fall to the same line that kind of thing for the bike racks for the, for the buses? I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe Nick can talk about it later. So many of the action items still need to be addressed and a lot of the ones that are left require cooperation between the council and their and the commission they're kind of bigger in scope the planning commission needs guidance from the council before pursuing some of these items because they would have quite a big community impact the goals for the planning commission are to provide better support and information to the city council and to recognize the priorities of the city council from the comprehensive plan at our last comprehensive plan, or at our last planning commission meeting, we reviewed some of these action items left remaining to complete. We went over eight of them, and then uh, we ranked them. And the top three items were were chosen to present to you to get your opinions, and if you think that they're worthwhile things to pursue. Those top three are: develop a tax increment financing policy for using public funds for private development projects, update the bike and pedestrian plan, and create a vacant building ordinance. Other items discussed, which were not ranked in the top three, were upgrade and update and create sub area plans. We just went over one of those for the uh, Cahill development off of West Avenue, Park West, where we have a sub area plan for that entire undeveloped area. We could use more of those in town so that when we have kind of this piecemeal development, there's still an overall guiding policy. Support the Healthy Neighborhoods Program, create a food truck policy, participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, which if we do that, it would lower flood insurance premiums for people who participate in the city, and then attend state planning conferences, which I think we're gonna go ahead and do anyway with um, just some budget through the planning department. So some further details on the top three action items. And what we're really looking for is, do you as a council think this is a good idea? Are we gonna be wasting our time looking into this, or are you going to, do you think this is a worthwhile pursuit? So the first one is develop a tax increment financing policy for using public funds for private development projects. This comes directly from uh, cl collaboration and partnership action item number four, which is develop an official city policy on the use of public incentives to support private development. And our goal from this would be to provide a clear set of criteria and guidelines to evaluate and judge TIF development proposals by. I know the council's had a few of those throughout the years and it, it seems like there's no real clear set of criteria, so that's what we would look to get through this, this process. And if you did say that, yes, this is, a, this is a good idea, this is what we want to do, uh, this is kind of a, a preliminary schedule or what, it, what this process would look like. Uh, first, the Planning Commission would have a meeting to discuss what tax increment financing is because there's still a lot of misinformation. There's not, there's not a lot known about tax increment financing by the general public as well as its benefits and drawbacks. We would then ask for feedback from the City Council on what direction they would like to go with the TIF policy. Planning Commission would then meet to draft a TIF policy, which would then be sent on to City Council for comments. After those comments are received, the Commission would finalize the TIF policy and again send it back to Council for approval. Uh, the second item we looked at was updating the bike and pedestrian plan. The bike and pedestrian plan was created in 2013 and since then we've had uh, a lot of improvements in our bike and pedestrian network. So we're, it's a little bit outdated and we, we, do, we should update it. So the goal would be to update the current bike and pedestrian plan to include projects that have been completed as well as plan near future projects and then incorporate our five year road plan into it as well for on street bike facilities as well as any shifting community preferences. And a preliminary schedule for this could look like the Planning Commission holds a public input meeting in a community venue and invites local bike groups to give input on recent progress as well as where to prioritize future facility upgrades. This could be held in the library or in a different event. We would invite local bike groups and contact places like Bickles and Nix to, to attend as well. Staff would then take into account the feedback from the public meeting as well as funding and grant timelines to propose a new five-year trail schedule to carry out the bike and pedestrian plan, which we then would need to upgrade, update again in five years. Then the Planning Commission would discuss the updated schedule and propose an amendment to our current bike and pedestrian plan for council approval. Now the third item discussed was create a vacant building ordinance. This directly reflects the economic prosperity action item number one, which is adopt a vacant building ordinance to better manage and maintain the city's vacant building stock. The goal of this would be to create a formal policy for addressing vacant and abandoned buildings, create a policy providing direction to staff on what type of nuisances to prioritize, 
as well as which type of abatement strategies to use. Um, a preliminary schedule for this would look like discussion with the council on nuisance property priorities as well as strategies for abatement of nuisances and format and impact of vacant building ordinance and or property maintenance ordinance. We have a lot of tools in our nuisance toolbox. They have different impacts on citizens, the dif differing degrees that you use them. Uh, we can be aggressive, we can you know, take a moderate line. We really would just like some direction from council on how far you want to push things on this. And after having that discussion, staff would develop an ordinance or set of ordinances to address vacant and blighted properties for review and consideration by the Planning Commission and Council, at which point then staff would update Council on our nuisance priorities, processes, options, and issues to update how we, how we tackle nuisances right now and what we prioritize. So that said, I'd like to have a discussion about these three items, whether or not you as a Council think they're a good idea to pursue, and if, if so, then we can get started working on these in 2018. The enforcement of those ordinances. Yeah, and I know it's, I know it's a difficult thing, it's a difficult situation, <coughs> and sometimes they can be handled case by case, mm -hmm. in a sense of, you know, on a, on a schedule of people. People go through different things, or people are just plain lazy. It's, and it's where do we draw that line, or do we draw the line? A lot of it takes time and money. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think the, the starting point is just having a discussion with the council. Of what are the priorities? How far do you want to, to see us push these things? And then having also a discussion about well, what are the, the costs and some of those repercussions associated with doing some of that stuff and get, getting that out in the open. Years, Chuck, I've been in Burlington that long, and there are buildings that I can remember as a kid. change the order to be the vacant building ordinance would be my number one priority simply because the entire time I've lived here as a kid 
since 76 on, there's been discussion about a vacant building ordinance, and we have not gotten it done. So you guys are, you're on the right track there. I would be really in favor of that, uh, in favor of an aggressive pursuit of it, to make sure that we're doing something with these buildings so they don't further decay. Um, echo what Matt said, it would help the council, help our council and, and future councils to have a, a policy on it. So then we don't have to necessarily weigh the options. Um, and on that, I'm biking the pedestrian plan, you know, that we're going to be helping the city at some point in time. we got to get that done. So I like those three, but for me, the most important would be vacant building. Okay. Something else that I kind of want to keep in mind is Last 20 years. Just saying to me, yeah. in 20 years, one project, that's not screaming to well, me that we need. But then there have been some developers that have moved out to West Burlington and, and were not potentially done with that. And, and so I don't know. And Andy, it sounds to me like what you're saying is if we do a TIF policy, examine ways where could some of that money be funneled to our older neighborhoods that are struggling instead of just new development. Yeah. Is that correct?
person going in and building, uh, for example, if he buys a large piece of ground and wants to put up uh, 50 homes, the infrastructure there alone can, can be extremely uh, burdensome. And, and that's where TIF is going to be appealing to somebody like that. Or if they're going in and, and putting in road and they're going to put up 20 homes, but those homes are four or $500,000, which I understand there are a lot of people in our community that can't afford that. But there are a lot of people in our community or that would come to our community that can't. And the market will dictate whether or not those homes are built. They just don't go over build those houses because they want to. They will only build those homes if they've got people that are going to build And I think I do like the idea of have tax abatement because a lot of communities don't, but I don't feel like the tax abatement that we have today is enough to put people over the edge to commit uh, to buying those types of houses. And to me, a developer building four or five hundred thousand dollar houses, he wants that tax abatement more than he wants the TIF. But a person building two hundred thousand dollar houses wants the TIF more than he wants the tax abatement. Because the incentive for the buyer is more with the abatement than it is more uh, for the person buying the lower house uh, if the infrastructure costs are covered uh, at a higher rate. And you're also looking at differences in density. Uh, there's a lot of differences work out. Um, that's why I think if we do move towards some type of policy that would be better to say, listen, um, if you're going to take the TIF, uh, these are going to be the parameters and this is going to be the term, whether that's five years, seven years, ten years, it's the same for everybody. Or if you're going to take the abatement, it's going to be this percent at this number of years and that's what you well, get. Well, it gives them an option. Right. And the developer would choose that. So when the developer comes in for their approval, they're going to say, listen, either A, I want the TIF, or B, uh, we're going to have to put the abatement on. And I love that we're having this discussion. Yeah. I think that we need to dive into this more when we start developing our TIF policy. Yeah. For now, we have to got about yeah. 10 minutes till the next cons the consultants come in and talk about the area-wide plan. It sounds to me, though, like you think that all three items are good items yeah. to pursue for 2018. I, I would say, though, Charlie, for, for me, a real, real close 3A is the food truck policy. Food truck policy. Because, yeah. you know, you got, you got, they're not investing in the brick and mortar. You know, okay. so you're not getting the property tax. So that you know, if, if, if they're opening up a restaurant or 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 it also addresses your building policy. Right. You know, I, I do think we need to look and see what other cities are doing. Uh -huh. I mean, everybody romanticizes the food truck thanks to Food Channel, and I'm honestly yeah. by my waistline, I, I like it too. <laughs> but, but you know, I I think I think we need to have some policy going forward sure. because they're going to keep coming. Yeah. And I've heard. Which we want. I, yeah, we want that. We want to encourage that. But I've heard it from restaurant tours in the area. That's right. It's not really fair because they can pick up and move to a different area. Yeah. Well, so I, I don't that's think that's right. People don't understand that they do pay. Yeah. Every time they come out, it's two hundred and fifty bucks a shot. I, I mean, it's not zero. Well, they that's true, but I think we, I think we should have. A sure. And we've actually done some legwork on that one already, so I don't think it would take too much time to develop. And obviously, we're still going to do the normal business of the rezonings and the planning unit developments. These are just the bigger projects where I didn't think we could do all eight of these in one year. But I, I think we can accommodate food trucks since we've already done a good amount of work on it already. The 657A, okay. Iowa Supreme Court, yeah. Is that something we need to wait on before you can determine the, the amount or the teeth that this ordinance will actually have? N not for this specific ordinance. This is one of our best tools we have, so it would be you know, be a bummer if it went away. But we can still do a vacant building ordinance without it or a set of property maintenance codes. But would it make sense to wait to find out what that, that the determination is on that before you start to dive into the Like strategy and prioritization okay. and stuff? It could. I don't know how long we'll be waiting, though. If we want, we can maybe jump into TIF policy or bike pedestrian plan right away, and then wait on the. Well, I would say essentially almost every food truck went down with the benchmark. Yeah. That's what we're creating. It's my baby. <laughs> 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 it's going to take the old Jeff. There's nothing that you guys can do to work on. Thank <laughs> you.
All right, well, I think we've accomplished what we need to do with this review, and I think we should do this once a year, kind of get back together and review what we've done during the year and what to do next year, and just foster that cooperation between the commission and the council. Absolutely. All right, Chris, do you have a PowerPoint you want to start putting up? You know what? It is on its way, so I'm just checking with the other crew that's driving in right now. Okay. Well, 10 minute break then. Well, I just had a quick question. You know, I know there's about a three fifths change to the, to the council, but is there anything the council like, 60 would like to see in terms of the commission or the planning commission? I mean, we, we, try, we try to be planners. Mm -hmm. We sometimes are reacting. We want to be planners, but is there something you guys have seen? You know, you have been on quite a while. And, I mean, it's just a question I have. Right? Sure. As one of the new guys in the room, is we can put something together on The food truck's fine. <laughs> All right, I'm going to fight for it. I should have gotten a double vote. <laughs> yeah, we had all our little individual things. That we want to all our pet projects. <laughs> it isn't always like that. I always, I always said the tallest person in the room gets first. You know, dips. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, think, I think all four are the things that are worthy of being uh, dealt with. And, yeah. I, I, I'm interested, you know, when we're talking about updating the bike and pedestrian plan, are there specific routes, um, details that you are more interested in than others? Or That would be a question more for a bike club that you talked about for you. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be really great to have a east-west connection through town somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. I know um, from recently on any, any sort of busy road, um, such as Roosevelt, that can be one of the most terrifying, well, not high-rise, that you'll ever have. Well, even Madison or Summer, that, those are probably routes very well used. And I do know for some of the bike clubs in town, they're already meeting right now. Citizens for Active Transportation. Yeah. Eric and I have been going to that. CFAT, as it's called. Yeah. CFAT. <laughs> Citizens for Active Transportation. And so, you know, but bringing all them in, and, and, because they, a lot of them have good ideas and thoughts and how they want routes to go and what roads to avoid. Because, like I said, Roosevelt, that was when I was on council, that was one of my biggest pet peeves, especially during wintertime, you're walking, watching people walk across the overpasses. There's no sidewalk, there's no guardrails, anything. You know, and unfortunately that's a state road. But how do we put pressure on the state to get some type of walkway system? Because there's people all the time that are walking. Well, I, yeah. I would say that, you know, the, the, the pathway around uh, Bluff Road now is fantastic. Yeah. But it's dark. It's very dark at night, and so that's it, and it goes down to Riverfront Park, which is dark yeah. at night. Mm -hmm. And so there's, it's somewhere, you know, if we're going to choose, you know, if that's going to complete and become part of a regular trail, because there's no street lights there, we're going to have to look at doing some solar lights or something there. I mean, that's it's yeah. dark. A river trail, and yeah, that one goes from Big Hollow down to eventually we're going to go to Mons Hollow. Yeah. Maybe the maybe the trails are okay. It's just that it needs some lighting and it needs cleaning yeah. up. Yeah, the, the the path is fine. I've ridden on it and walked on it. It's, it's, it's just it, it, it's it's very dark there because unless the car's going by the headlights, there's no real lights. Yeah, that's not safe. Yeah. Did you say Yeah. I don't think we have our our next PowerPoint presentation ready yet, so we can break. Yeah, but uh, they're waiting on a person with the, the slides. <laughs> the worst person to be late. Yeah. I guess I should have done introductions before we started, but I completely forgot about that.
has retired. <laughs> Everything that they say. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's good to hear. Did you go to Now I got you. Now I got you. It went really well. I was going to say, we, we had some pretty good deposits out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently there were 12 people at the book, so I had some chocolate change. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Good, because I was going to be so embarrassed to have the two people. Yeah. No, there were 12 that showed up. I think it was like the Dan Bowes students showed up at the hotel. And, uh, that's one of those ones that I remember. Yeah, it's, I'm still kind of.
Very good. Okay. This is a good summary. Yeah, yeah good summary. Um, real quick, I'd like to do some quick introductions. I know we have some, some newer folks around here that I think weren't here last time. So if, if we could just go around the table very quickly, name and kind of um, what your role is, Mayor. Shane Campbell. I have been looking to play the mayor on TV. <laughs> <laughs> John Phillips recently elected to the city council. Hi, John. Linda Murray, City Council, and I was hoping I didn't have to speak tonight, but now that I have, <coughs> it's my son's 15th birthday. So unfortunately, I'll be cutting out here at 5 30. Watch him play basketball. Okay. Enjoy Sorry, that. I'll leave people early. Matt Rinker, uh, City Council elect. Okay. Hi, Matt. Brian Gross, I'm on the Planning Commission. Florence Paterno, Planning Commission. Florence. Chris Reed, Planning Commission. Jeff Griffin, Planning Commission. Patty Jager, Planning Commission. Chris Roberts, I'm the County Rep of the Planning Commission. Good. Very good. I'm Mike Fisher from Impact 7G. We are also working on the Brown, EPA Brownfield assessment side of the project, which means we're doing some um, environmental investigations on properties that we hope to um, help move through a redevelopment process so we can complete some of that work, some of these properties, and move through quicker. Um, so, so we're kind of working these things in tandem here. Um, I'm Patrick Albert. I'm a principal with Confluence. Um, we are providing uh, the work and design concepts for the Catalyst sites. I've got a team with me, Chris Shires, uh, principal from our Des Moines office, a former planner here in Burlington. Um, maybe you've seen him. Uh, ben Sandell, a landscape architect in my office in Cedar Rapids, is a Burlington native, uh, and he's been working pretty closely with us on this too. So we're excited to share a few ideas and get some feedback on what we're doing. So if we're ready, okay. yeah. we'll jump into it. How yep. many people have time constraints? And okay, everybody. <laughs> Everybody's got a time constraint. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, so this was this presentation is it's only four hours long. It's, it's, it's four hours, but it's a quick four hours. So, um, <laughs> uh, it, it really isn't a, a lengthy presentation. It's it's kind of loose and fast, and the idea is to share with you just a few thoughts that we have on primarily three catalyst sites on the project. Before we get into that, um, let's just talk about where we're at in this project timeline. If you can see the screen, it would be best because most everything that we're going to share, at least initially, is up on screen. And then once we get through this initial electronic stuff, um, we have an opportunity for those of you who want to participate um, to get the markers out and, and do a little coloring uh, on some plans. If some of the ideas that we share and cite or enthuse you to, um, to share some ideas that you, maybe you have for these areas, then we'd like to get them on paper so that we have them uh, as a part of our thought process moving forward. So where we're at uh, right now is here Monday. Well, it's not Monday. It's uh, Thursday, and I didn't update the, the day of the week, just the date. Um, this is Catalyst Site Workshop and Charette Joint Workshop number two. Um, we've had a few sponsor group meetings. We had a public input workshop on Wednesday, the 25th of October uh, that we had pretty good attendance in, and we shared some initial thoughts on some of these sites there as well. And moving forward, we'll have um, some additional meetings uh, with our sponsor group and the rest of our design team. And we're really looking to wrap this thing up uh, sometime in the middle of next year, 2018. Um, we'll do some final plan presentations uh, to the public uh, in our last public meeting. But, but right now, we're at it's really the first opportunity for us to share some of the, the working um, ideas on the Catalyst sites. And if you've missed some of these meetings, there's a bootload of materials on the, the BurlingtonBrownfields.com website that can help catch you up, um, including some materials that were presented at the um, public meeting. So uh, feel free to browse that, burlingtonbrownfields.com. All right, so we're gonna jump right into the first Catalyst site. Uh, Dresser Rand, um, on the west side of town, is Catalyst site number one for this project, and we've got three that we've really focused our attentions on. Um, we also have a sort of running list of other potential sites um, that could be catalytic uh, if given full attention uh, and a decent development horizon. And part of our work is going to address those sites, um, but it's really not our purpose for this evening. We wanted to, to really dig in and start to talk about some ideas. So Dresser Rand, 
obviously went through a process uh, of mitigation and remediation over the last couple of years. It's now in a pretty good state. Uh, it's reasonably green. Um, it's been fairly well encapsulated and, and most of the nasty stuff's been taken off the site and it's sitting there ripe for opportunity for development. We're getting into some of the final stages with the Iowa DNR on um, closing out that site. So we're, we're, we're getting there, uh, we're about there. Uh, there'll be some environmental covenants that attach to the deed on that site that kind of restrict a little bit what you do there. Um, but it is, it has got, we've come a very long way. <laughs> so in our public meeting, we asked the, the attendees to provide us with some ideas on what they would like to see uh, on this particular catalyst site. And the word cloud that you see on the screen is kind of the summary uh, of the ideas that we've gotten. And you can see very clearly that park and green space and dog park uh, really were kind of the primary feedback for that area. So using this, uh, we've developed uh, a concept for the site that uh, preserves the openness of the site, but makes it more functional. And I'm gonna let Ben talk about that one a little bit. Um, and I apologize, the graphics um, are gonna be a little bit difficult to read, and it might actually just be easiest if we if I stand. You want me to stand and do it? All right. Yeah, I can stand and point. So as Mike and Patrick alluded to, we've done a lot of work to clean the site up, but it's kind of the biggest eyesore in town right now. You guys all know that, you hear about it all the time. But it's also a very difficult site to work with, with the railroad track running right down the middle of it. So coming up with a unique um, use is one of our challenges here, but we think we've accomplished that in a couple different unique ways. So on the south side, I'll start on the south side of the railroad tracks. It's largely a green space. Um, as we drove into town today, you can see there's still standing water out there. That's obviously an issue that we need to address, and so we've kind of a taken an attempt to address that and created some depressions and you can see those in the dark green um, kind of amoebas right there where Patrick is pointing. So those would be actually depressions and planted with wetland plantings to kind of infiltrate some of that stormwater that's coming out of the site. Um, while we're scooping that site, uh, that ground out, we're actually creating some berms, we call them drumlins, um, that are actually have trees on them and you can kind of see the shadows poke throughout there. And the idea there is we're creating these berms, kind of creating some, some spatial difference between the ground plane and vertical planes, and also using those um, to cultivate and use as a living nursery almost, where we're planting saplings within these berms, and then once they grow up into a two or three inch caliper tree, we would actually be uh, implementing or, or extracting them from site here and then putting them into a street tree improvement plan. So we're taking trees out of here and then putting them into the downtown streetscape plans. Um, so it's kind of a working farm, but yet it's still maintained as a park, park green space that people can come and visit. And then on the opposite side of the railroad tracks um, is a parking lot. Basically, you know, as Mike um, alluded to, there's gonna be some constraints on what we can do on this site. Um, this actually functions fairly well with, uh, as being a trailhead. So we know that the regional trails will come through here. Um, so it's a trailhead park, parking lot, and then you actually have trail systems on both sides of the tracks. And then this parking lot actually functions really well for a, a, an expansion um, business up there. We're seeing a restaurant or a brewery type business utilizing that courtyard that's existing in that uh, existing vacant building up there, the old... Can, can you show me where the overpass is? I'm having a problem the overpass. The okay, thank you. Right here, and then 34 is right here, so you come up that hill. Okay, thank you. Can just see the, high, the highway outside the image here. Okay. Sorry. So that's the old uh, ice and cold storage um, facility, or at least parts of it, and so the idea is to take that and turn it into a commercial business and then utilize that parking and the green space in between, in between the parking and the business um, as outdoor recreation space or games or maybe a, a small concert venue. You can see an amphitheater in there. So one of the things that this plan does is it de-emphasizes the intersection with agency here um, and really takes it offline as what, we would, what most people feel is a cross connection over the rail line even though the barriers are pretty clearly there. And it, it feels a lot more like uh, a parking lot that you would find at a trailhead um, or at a, at a public park. And just de-emphasizing that's gonna do a lot to uh, really change the complexion of that intersection. So we have some different perspectives here. Um, you can see the parking lot on the left and then you start to see some of the undulations of the drumlins, as we call them, berms, if you will, on the trees on the other side. And so for now, we're, you know, we're, we're showing some sort of trail connection as it would come under the underpass. That could occur on either side 
of the rail line depending on where it needs to be from an overall <coughs> connectivity perspective. Um, one thing we didn't talk about on the previous plan is as part of this concept, um, we really need to work with the railroad to develop a signalized pedestrian crossing here so that folks that are using this as a trailhead or coming here to spend some time in this, in this park have a safe way to, to cross over uh, and utilize the, the south side of the tracks. At the same time, one of the other ideas that we've talked about that isn't represented in this image is using some sort of a permanent barrier, a low wall, um, or fencing, you know, iron fencing column kind of configuration to physically uh, demarcate the edge between the parking lot, the park, and the railroad lines and keep people from running across there in that uncontrolled intersection. Would you need that on both sides? You don't theoretically need it on both sides, um, but it, it could occur. That Probably way. more on the parking lot yeah. side. You see how that trail is closer? Again, um, some of the idea here too is that you know, Patrick conveyed this earlier at a meeting we had, but some of the idea is we want to make sure we can see across the tracks and see the other side. We don't want to close it in with a solid wall necessarily that you can't see through or over. So maybe a four foot column, sprit columns, and we're thinking possibly doing this if there's if there's a building that has to come down in Burlington and we can recapture some of that brick is and the, and if the building has any kind of historical context to then use that same material here um, for those columns with the iron structure in between and somehow give some uh, credence to the historical content context of that building that had to come down. We do see this occasionally being done the, that way in, in many of the communities um, and maybe there's a plaque on, on one or two of the columns that talks about the history of that building and where those bricks came from. Is um, there a reason there's not a an underpass being considered? Underneath the railroad tracks yeah. from one side to the other? Yeah. We haven't discussed it. G often they're problematic from an engineering standpoint. I, I, I agree with you, man. It would seem logical mm -hmm. to have something like that and, and very convenient, um, but they can be problematic from an engineering standpoint. We're talking about an pedestrian mm -hmm. so, so we're talking about, um, we used to, so I ran into this, a similar situation where, where we had about 50% of the public split on it in the city of Cedar Rapids under a major roadway of doing the same thing. And one of the problems we kept running into is, is simply a, a bathtub. I mean, so we have some heavy rain events, and how do we handle the flow of water that wants to, especially on this site, that wants to migrate there? But, but it, it would be, seem logical. <laughs> so I, I think on this site the key takeaways are, are, are twofold. Um, one, we're not recommending intense architectural development, if you will, on the site because it's, it's problematic in a number of ways. And as it relates to everything else that's going on in and around downtown, it's, it's in kind of a funky spot within the fabric of the community to try to envision uh, a mixed use development or something that's going to drive um, a lot of uh, visitors to this area to, to, to shop at a, at a building or to, to live in this particular area with the, with the railroad tracks um, so active. So low intensity development on the actual physical dresser ran site, but try to catalyze um, development of the properties to the north and to the west that are interesting architecturally. Um, they have some significance. We don't want to take them down. And with the right vision and investment could be pretty significant. And, and we're that seeing really is what, what drives the, this project. Right. And, and what we're seeing is this catalyze that development to the north even beyond what we're showing here, potentially long term. So in the grand scheme of things, things 15, 20 years from now, um, which is not uncommon in, the, in terms of the time frame of redevelopment in communities, we see continued redevelopment up to the north here um, of you know, potentially more, um, probably more higher, uh, higher use, higher property tax value type development, um, and hoping that this will help catalyze that, bring people to the area via the trail system, via the, having the availability of parking there for those other uses to the north as well. So, so this has any potential for like a Leopold site of any kind? Or? 
So that would be, so Leopold, you're talking in terms of an, an agricultural context? Conservation and right. things like that. Right. I, I think it does. Um, realize wetlands are used, being more commonly used right now for um, flood resiliency, for stormwater cleansing, um, stormwater holding, so quantity. Um, I guess I was thinking about more like an educational center that's out vehicle. And it's right along the railroad tracks that people coming through town would see that this is his home sure. place. You know, I mean, you could build that up. Yeah, I, I, that's an outstanding idea. So I think we need to take note of that yep. and um, it's a natural fit. And, and see what we can do there. This, this is a match. I think we do have the whole site. Creek runs under the railroad. Yeah, okay, I didn't know if the whole and, site was. And occasionally, uh, one of the sites might not be. Yeah. Right. Occasionally, in the last 15 years, the Hawkeye Creeks run over the site. Right. So, so your resiliency to rushing water is probably got to be part of this plan. Okay, that's a good comment, too. And that's actually, I don't know if we have a good shot of those drumlins, but they're all kind of formed in a way that it looks like the water is actually moving through there from a historic perspective. And so when that water does come up, you'll still see those trees kind of popping out of the water, but it, it's, it's meant in the design of those berms to, to emulate that creek flow. Other thoughts on this site from the group while we're still on it? Other thoughts on this site? Is there going to be some type of access from the south side of the So if, if somebody were to park here and try to get across with the train, and they're across and then the train comes through and stops, right? Now they'd have to come back around or wait for the train to pass. It is. Um, in theory, you could run up to the, uh, uh, the bridge. Yeah, pass. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way to, to access that. Outside, so is yeah. there going to be an actual trail that will go back yep. around so they can walk yeah. over? Yeah, yeah. actually. This uh, connects, yeah, right? That goes yeah. underneath that viaduct yeah. that you're yeah. talking about. So will there be parking on the south side? For there's not much room to get in there for parking. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Parking we've located up on the north side there off the agency. Here. Uh, and the other issue there is, as parking pulling off of that from the bridge, there's some there's some sight line issues and, and sure. a whole lot of real estate. So there. are you going to open agency then to the park? I mean, it's, it it's dead no. ended it now, is, isn't it? it? No, it, it, it's, it's dead ended in the rail line, line, but that's right. It comes right here. down, but. Yeah, you basically have a turnaround through that parking lot. Right. Now. It's yeah. still it's still uh, closed for vehicular traffic. Okay. Yes. Is it but at the end of that parking lot, you, can you get on onto, um, what is that, there, Central? This is Agency. No, right no here. Central. No, no, no. 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 You see how you can't cross oh, the track. You know, yeah. yeah. can't get on There will be a great separation. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But there, there's no, is there a possibility of some sort of overpass being built along the side of that structure? You see what I'm getting at? To be it for vehicles or for no for pedestrians for pedestrians here yeah I mean just like a like a fire escape type of structure on an over like a, a pedestrian walkway but oh, sure. you know since it's on the side of that bridge there's already an infrastructure there to hook it onto it's not a total I think build it's a I think it does have a sidewalk adjacent to it now we also got the ADA issues too right I'm just concerned about the railroad crossing, I think the first accident there is the death of this project. There's People a, there's there's a sidewalk along the whole overpass mm -hmm. you go up And realize, folks, that, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, you know, are you going to do this? Well, this is your plan, so, and this is very early, so we've got lots of room for input. We're on the same page on that, though. We're on the same page. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but if we can improve it anyway, like some of the suggestions that we've heard tonight, and you think of some later, um, don't hesitate to let us know. We, you can also let us know via the website. We've got an input form on there, too. Um, feel free to provide that input, and you know there's some great suggestions that are made here tonight. So, I don't know how, you know, how, how deep it, or how long is that site? Is it about 300 feet? 
400 feet? Which side are you? Well, the, the whole, the, the length of the side. If you run it at the diagonal, which is uh, yeah. the railroad track, I mean, you're talking probably three, over, a little over 300, about 300 feet, yeah. So, uh, what I'm thinking is it, it could be big enough for, for just a little practice frisbee golf area. Little three holer or something like that. Just a except for the disc going on the tracks. No, I, it, I play disc golf, yeah, and I'm terrible. That. And when I throw them, they always go on the. <laughs> I think but but that's that's a good idea if we could somehow constrain the three hole course. You know, um, what you see end up happening instead of the disc that people are throwing, they end up throwing regular frisbees. The wind catches them, and all of a sudden we've got. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I think the important. The important part of the conversation is that the basic concept is acceptable. People right, like right. it. Yeah. We're all kind of on board with the fact that this develops as a less intensive landscape or functional landscape, and then there are a number of different layers that we can start to investigate for, you know, education, recreation, that kind of fit the baseline concept. The, the other important part is does it complement the again? We're, we've got a variety of uses around this. Does it complement those uses? Yeah. Does it not? Um, you know, and I think something like this does. It, it isn't in contrast to what the uses are around there. It doesn't pro prohibit them from doing what they're doing. And actually will help hopefully beautify the area, if you will. When I see a natural flow, I think it just it flows along. Okay, nice. very good. Good, okay. so well, let's move on to concept or catalyst site number two. This one's a little different. This is more urban. Um, so from the very beginning, We've identified the typewriter shop building as a, a very um, specific catalyst project. And because we're landscape architects and planners, and I'm the only architect in our group, um, we've expanded our view to look at the typewriter block and perhaps the moose building block as more of the catalyst site and try to investigate opportunities. We're not suggesting that the typewriter shop itself isn't a great catalyst project, it certainly is. Um, but there are other opportunities that have started um, to identify themselves in this area. So in this graphic, you see that we're kind of looking at this whole area as potential development opportunity um, and not just the building itself. And that's going to lead us into uh, some of the things that we talked about with our pu at our public input meeting. You know, what would you like to see happen here? How could you see something developing in or around or adjacent to the typewriter shop building? hotel, restaurant, bar, some things that already exist, uh, like a bar in the vicinity um, or right next door as, as really the things that the public sees as being the most appropriate uses in this area. So to that end, uh, you also see Boutique Hotel, and I'm, I'm going to mention that uh, specifically because we're going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> there's some interesting opportunities that occur here. And I want to just kind of go around this image and, and talk about the typewriter shop building first um, because I don't want that to be overlooked. Uh, as an architect that's been in the building, um, I can tell you, and I hope that some of you have been in the building, I can tell you that the architectural significance of the fourth floor of that building is out of this world. It is beautiful. It has so much potential if it can be restored um, to even a small percentage of its original grandeur. So a primary a recommendation and priority number one, as far as I'm concerned, is to try to preserve and keep that fourth floor uh, at some semblance of itself uh, or what it was. It presents an interesting uh, place for uh, a venue, a meeting hall, a wedding venue. There's all kinds of things that can be done up there. And if we, if we try to change that from what it is now, um, then we'd lose that architecture altogether. And I think that would be a, a huge mistake. So. That's the fourth floor working down, um, floors two and three, a uh, little bit less architecturally significant, um, would likely be best just shelled out and wait for a tenant improvement, somebody to come in and say, you know, we really love this area, we love what's happening around here, there's enough square footage here that we think we can bring our small company downtown and, and these two floors would be a great area to do that with. So at, at this stage in the game, I would suggest that, that that's the approach that you take for floors two and three. Uh, the ground floor, uh, two things I think can happen there. One, it can be developed um, for retail use, uh, but to make that really work, I think that the facade needs to be brought back um, to what it was originally. I think some stuff was lost there when we went over and, and clad that facade with newer materials. So if we can uncover that, open those windows up, get that corner exposed a little bit, 
um, it becomes a really nice location for some retail retail establishment. Um, you know, going back to to any of the things that you see here, you've got small retail opportunities. Um, you've got art store. You've got some different types of shops that might find some space in that building desirable. I don't think the building can be developed into a, an effective and efficient boutique hotel of any kind. And so that's why I mentioned boutique hotel before. I don't think the typewriter shop is necessarily the building for that. As it sits now, there's better use for it. The parking ramp has been uh, something that we've discussed, and I think internally, or at least as a sponsor group, we've had discussions about the ability to add a deck onto that parking ramp, that it was the structure was designed um, to accommodate another deck. Unfortunately, the parking ramp is too narrow to do that with two-way traffic. It's only 120 feet wide, plus or minus a few inches, and you need 128 feet to make a, a two-way ramp work effectively. So it's not likely that we can add a deck to that and have it be an efficient parking system. So that recommendation is here. And then finally, we've had some discussions about the Moose Building and the police station that sits next to it. The Moose Building is another one of those architectural gems that if brought back, facade preserved, interior cleaned out. I've not been in the interior of that building, so I don't know yet what it looks like or how chopped up it is. Um, but at least from an exterior perspective, that facade's really special, it's unique, um, and could, could really be something special and attractive um, if brought back. The police station, on the other hand, um, is a bit lackluster. Um, and, and I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you for your kind use it's, of words. It's lackluster. <laughs> Architecturally speaking, it's lackluster. Again, I've not been in the building. Ben said he was in the building. I don't know if he was incarcerated as a teen or what. Um, <laughs> just recently, wasn't it? Just recently. Right? <laughs> Looking at it from an architectural perspective, it's you know it's a fairly opaque facade. It's got small punch window openings. It's I'm certain it's fairly chopped up on the inside, and it's it's not the type of not the type of building you're going to go in and go. That would make a great hotel. So. My recommendation for the police station is take it down, preserve the Moose Building. Okay. On the police station site, let's develop a hotel concept that could or could not connect to the Moose Building. So if the Moose Building, we can't find somebody that comes in and says, hey, we want to take this whole building and do something with it, maybe it's ground floor retail and its office is up above, there is the opportunity to develop a hotel concept that takes the Moose Building and uses that as its primary entrance and then communicates to the north with a tower that has sleeping rooms in it. And use tower, think loosely, it's four to six stories, probably not much more than that, um, but the opportunity is there. Um, if the Moose Building connection doesn't make sense, then that stands alone as its own entity, and the hotel concept can be developed ground up on the police station site. It's a wide enough site that you can make it work. Um, it's not a suburban, Home with Suites or Holiday Inn Express. It's got the potential to be a cool downtown hotel that's got great views of historic neighborhoods and churches and the river simultaneously and should really be thought of as an opportunity to do that. Um, think in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 room hotel if you come up to six floors. With the Moose Building staying in place, you lose window opportunities um, for a couple of floors on the south side of the building. So We've got a plan for that, um, but you gain opportunities on the back of the building to start to look out over the river uh, and then on the front of the building to be able to look west into um, the neighborhoods of downtown. So what does that look like? Hopefully this is going to switch the way I need it to. I think I switched two plans. So I've got um, a, a colorful graphic here that's really small. We've got the capability to take all this stuff and put it into a handout packet. Um, but we haven't done that yet. We'll send it back to the sponsor group and make sure that gets distributed if we think it's important. But the purpose of this image is just to orient you to what you're going to see on the next slide. Um, this is the Moose Building parking ramp. Um, and we're kind of ex anticipating that the, um, the front of the building would be on third. Okay, so all of the plans that you see on the next slide are, are oriented with the river to the top of the top of the screen. So what I did was just said, okay, I've got this 60 foot wide footprint, I've got 118 feet to work with, I need to develop a hotel concept, what am I gonna put in here? Uh, so starting from the left, you know, on the ground floor, you've got your lobby and reception area, you've got a couple of stair towers um, on the upper left and lower right hand corner, an elevator that 
or a pair of elevators that runs up through the middle of this building. You've got some back house space, and then you've got this opportunity on the ground floor for lounge and dining that would face or abut Columbia and Third and really kind of shape the corner of that building. Moving up to the second floor, um, really that's kind of unprogrammed space. What do you do on the second floor of a hotel um, if it's not sleeping rooms? It's, it's potential convention space, it's meeting rooms, um, it could be a second floor bar, it could be unprogrammed for a number of different opportunities. You'd still have the same back of house space potentially because that's adjacent to the Moose building and has limited river view. As you move up, uh, you start to get into your sleeping room. So the dark blue or these blue squares here are more deluxe suites, so a little larger sized rooms. You've got them on the, the back, uh, what would be the southeast corner overlooking the river and up in the front, and then some standard rooms that run along, and then it's more back of house service, gym type space along the Moose building side of it. And in this particular plan, the opportunity exists at every floor to connect through the middle of the building right over to the Moose building as you come up uh, and the floor plates meet at that same level. And then up above a typical sleeping floor, as you get up above the roof line of the Moose building, starts to have more deluxe rooms that face to the south looking towards downtown and the river, standard sleeping rooms along the north, and then that same stack of, of deluxe or suite type rooms out on uh, the north third street side. So the building itself or the footprint itself could work pretty well for a hotel. It, it takes somebody that's got a little bit of vision um, and is okay with spending a little more money than what you would build a suburban hotel for, um, but it can definitely be done and it can be very cool. So from a massing perspective, uh, again, this is just real quick. This is your Moose building. This gives you a sense of height. Um, this is essentially a six-story building. Um, so it's got high first and second floor levels that match up uh, with the Moose building floor plates. And these are just kind of um, based on the architecture of the Moose building. I've just kind of delineated where I think the floor lines are. Um, you can communicate across. And then as you get up to that third floor level, it gets to a, a little shallower floor to floor. Uh, and you can stack that building and, and get up above that. So it doesn't end up being a really tall building. Uh, it's a reasonably appropriate mass next to the Moose building, considering where it sits in downtown. Um, it could work pretty well. And I think that's a, it's a, a pretty good opportunity for that particular site. There are some things we don't particularly like about that site as it relates to how you come off of 34 on Main Street. You're coming up the back side of this thing. Um, but we take that as it is because of where it sits. Uh, you've got the potential for service access off of the alley <coughs> on the lower level of that building, and you can still really navigate circulation around the building from the front door, come back around the box, and park in the parking ramp, and, and it probably works pretty well. And it's an interesting um, type of idea for downtown that's different than thinking of a Marriott or a Hilton or something like that coming in. When we think of boutique hotels or small hotels in Iowa, Hotel Pati and Perry comes to mind. Most people know um, or have some idea of what that's all about. And you can see architecturally it's very different than what we might propose here. Um, but I thought it was important that we talk about it because it is really one of the few boutique hotels in Iowa. Um, one of my favorites in Minneapolis is the Hewing. This is a conversion. This is pretty new. Um, these types of projects present some really interesting opportunities in, in how you um, adapt and reuse an existing architecture, but still make it fun and fresh and new. And while that doesn't um, lend itself to new construction, because we can't build like this anymore um, for a reasonable cost, it does start to give uh, an idea of what other buildings in downtown Burlington that have this sort of flavor could become if you start to generate that momentum long term. So what I would like to do, and uh, get everybody um, talking with me a little bit here is I've got a series of slides that have two pictures each on them, an A and B. <coughs> Architecturally, they have different styles. Um, just by show of hands, I'm going to ask you, know, what do you think of, do you like A or do you like B on each slide? And this is just going to give me a little idea from an architectural aesthetic standpoint, kind of where things are at. And why I'm asking you to do this is, as we think more and more about this particular Catalyst site, I've got to develop a little bit of an architectural aesthetic that we can use to build a prettier picture. Um, and I want it to be consistent with what you think would be appropriate in the Burlington downtown. So, And just, just to recapture a little bit for those men who may not have been here when we discussed the market study, 
the market study essentially concluded that there was, um, there would be ample demand for 34 to 40 room hotel, I think is what it said here in, in Burlington. So that was a you know, fairly detailed market analysis of the area, downtown specifically. So, so that is in part where some of this is coming from, to tie it back. Both to what we heard from the public and, and water market correct, analysis. Correct, correct, yep. correct, sorry. Yeah. All right, so show of hands, A or B, A? I would live in A, but I think B would go, would make it more so in room. Okay, she's I'm answering two questions. I'm, 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 no, I really appreciate it, thank you. I really no, I, appreciate. I like a, but I don't, I think B would, would make it more so in Berlin. Let's talk it through more what you like, not what you think works in Burlington. Okay. I like B because I think A looks a little too Palm Beach y to me. Okay, Maybe so we might show of hands for A. I think I have one, two definitively. Okay. B. Everybody else? <laughs> Did we get someone who didn't raise their hand? And just, so you know, <laughs> just for, for quick reference, the hotel on the right was just recently constructed in Iowa City. Yeah. Okay. All right. A or B, we'll start with A. So this one, just for clarity's sake, is an existing building with a modern wrap on it that comes around, which is kind of different. And B is a, an even hotel. It's new construction, about four stories tall. And I've Projector screen image is a little unclear. I apologize. They so, asked that question again. They really weren't paying attention. So A is a historic building that has a more modern wrap around it that you see on the outside. All right. And, and the B. Couple. All right. This just for reference is a really analog way to do image preferencing. So um, A. Good. And, and B, about four, maybe five. Okay. Another A. Okay. And B. That one's pretty even. I'd almost give B. Um, for those of you that chose A, what did you like about it? I'd say there's two different buildings. Yeah. I mean, one is obviously a building that's been there a long time and been repurposed. The other one's got more new construction work to it. So, okay. uh, two different situations. A little bit? I can tell you why, why I didn't pick it. <laughs> Say that one more time, please. I just didn't like the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a Sure. Well, I think with, with A, it, it, they blend. And with a lot of downtown tourist areas, they blend, and that's what people like. You know, there's just their hotel, and then shop, and then dine. Sure. So I'm just thinking about like building that, and okay. how everything was just smooth. And but, but as someone who stays at a lot of hotels like that, there's Two, thing, two problems I have with it. A, you're not going to be able to pick it out very easily when you're going up and down the street and you're from out of town. And B, where you, you know, you're, you can haul your luggage a block and a half. I mean, where do you park? There's, sure. there's a lot of logistical problems with it to me. Steve? Just, just to clarify, there's a hotel you're interested in doing this project. Yeah. And there, I would say, kind of on the fast track. Right now, their intention or the, the, what they're discussing is is keeping the Lewis building, removing the uh, police station, and building something fairly complementary to the architecture of the existing Lewis building. Yeah. Okay. And they were at the public meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were rock stars at the <laughs> public meeting. I just want to clarify that. They were. All right. A. This is in Coralville. And B. That's in, actually in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Another A, B, A. Everybody likes A. Good. B. B's in Iowa City. It's Plaza Towers. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I appreciate you participating in that. That's as we look at it, it's just going to give us a little bit of an opportunity to kind of see aesthetically where things are sitting, materiality. At one point in time, when they put the parking ramp in, back when they first put that in and they put in the C store, there was some discussion about extending that deck over the fuel pump area, mm. and the, and they were going to do it at one point in time, but C, it was a, it was a come and go back then did not have the money to do so. Sure. But there was a real attraction because it protected their clientele by getting gas getting into the building. I think that would be one way maybe to look at some additional parking around that facility too. Sure. Just a single story extension of that deck. Okay. Any other comments on hotel architecture? Can I quickly add something? Hotels generally have two access points. Yeah. Uh, even even the one in Perry does. You can come in through the back off the parking off back. Yeah. So we'll have that access off that lower level. It's ground level on the main street basically, mm -hmm. yep. and the riverfront versus walking up the hill. There's just some amenities. Absolutely. It, it complicates development agreement with uh, the seat store sitting right there, the gas station right there on the <laughs> on the east. But um, I'm sure that can all be worked through. All right. We're going to move on to catalyst site number three. Um, this one uh, is another another opportunity. This is the riverfront, and, and the image really identifies all of the riverfront as catalyst site number three. We've really focused our attentions more to the south um, for the purposes of this study because there's always already been some really great planning. There's already um, things in motion in developing um, the land that Smith Group JJR completed with you. So we don't suggest by any stretch of the imagination that you re-envision your riverfront to be contrary to what's already been done. Everything that we're really looking at is focused on Memorial Auditorium and how that might be used, reused, or removed, and then what other opportunities exist around the Memorial Auditorium site. So, uh, when we shared <laughs> Catalyst site, I know, Big letters. I'm looking for, Big letters. I'm looking for guns, really. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got rotten tomatoes? <laughs> when we uh, when we shared catalyst number or catalyst site number three with the public, splash pad came out as number one. Um, interesting opportunity, public art, park, <laughs> gathering space. These are all things that fit with the planning that's already been done for the riverfront. Really, the the big unknown. For the city and in our conversations with the sponsor group is, what do you do with Memorial Auditorium? And correct me if it's a four hundred thousand dollar a year hit on the city to maintain this building. Wow, who is this guy? There are right. numbers around like that. <laughs> <laughs> I figure I'm in a safe place, right? You're, a safe place. you're all well aware of what we have to leave here. Memorial Auditorium. <laughs> 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 So what, what do you do with a building like that? That's a, a, it's taxing on the community if it's not being utilized to its full yes. potential, right? Yes. Is that a good way to put it there? Yes. Taxing on the community if it's not being used to its full potential. The current plan for the riverfront accepts that Memorial Auditorium stays in place. 
it doesn't really envision much in the way of reuse of the building. Let's hope we can get some people to come in and get our visitor days in this building up, maybe generate a little revenue in the building. It's a challenging space architecturally because it's multi-level, it's got an arena floor, it's got stadium seating, a balcony. What do you do with that? Okay. The example that I've been sharing with our team uh, and that I tend to, to point to pretty regularly in conversations is it's not dissimilar to Veterans Auditorium in Des Moines. The Veterans Auditorium, when the Iowa Events Center was being constructed in Wells Fargo Arena, was a property that the city of Des Moines said, we don't want to let this go. It's a nice footprint. The exterior of the building is still in good shape, but we really need to reimagine how we're going to use this thing because anything we would do in vets, we can do a little bit bigger in Wells Fargo Arena. Well, this isn't the same size as Vets Auditorium, right? Quite a bit smaller. Uh, different size community, too. But it doesn't mean that the same opportunity doesn't exist with this space. If it can be done at that scale. It can certainly be done at a smaller scale. The unknown here is how much of this exterior architecture can we preserve if we start to take the interior stuff out and rethink this as your convention center? So you're taking out the arena floor, you're taking out the stadium seating and the balconies, and we're coming in and we're doing a multi-level meeting center here where you can start to divide this space up into, uh, into a facility that can be rented at different square footages for different size meetings and conventions. It's something that we don't currently have in downtown Burlington. You know, facilities like this exist out in West Burlington, but this may be the most viable opportunity that we see to take this from the interior architecture that it has and start to make sense out of it as an exterior volume. So if you think of it in that respect and start to look at the development that exists around it, it seems to me the first question that a lot of people ask is, well, if there's a convention down here, where am I staying? Mm -hmm. So the hotel, her place. Her place. <laughs> so a hotel concept really has to be thought of as part of a, an imagined reuse of Memorial Auditorium as a convention or a meeting center. We talked about a boutique hotel up the, up the hill, but is that enough to accommodate what might be needed here? Now, bear in mind that we're thinking about this in terms of the space, its location within the context of the community. There hasn't been any specific market analysis done on this. The market analysis that we did as it relates to a downtown hotel pointed to 40 rooms, maybe 30 rooms, but there wasn't a there wasn't a convention center as a part of that thinking. It wasn't in the analysis. context of the okay, It wasn't center. in that same context. So we could project with some concert with a conservative view and say, okay, maybe we need 80 to 100 hotel rooms downtown if we have a viable and functioning convention uh, and meeting facility in downtown. It's a projection. It's conservative. Um, and let's, let's say that we get to that point. So now we need space for a little bigger hotel if we want to accommodate it all in we do that? Well, let's talk about a couple of different options. As you look at the whole context of the riverfront, we've got park development that we know is going to occur in here as a part of the riverfront development. We don't want to change that. I really like what Smith Group JJR presented as a part of the riverfront development. Um, I think it's interesting. It's contextual. Uh, it's going to do really great things for your downtown. Um, but there are also other opportunities here. We've got the building. Uh, and for the time being, let's just accept that the building stays in place and we're going to adapt it as a meeting room convention center. Now we need to find a place to put a hotel. A logical first step or first site is immediately to the south over an existing parking lot. Granted, it's right next to the river, but there are lots of things we can do architecturally to get rooms up above the floodplain to provide parking underneath in a structured facility and have a hotel sit above it and then create some connections to that reimagined Memorial Auditorium. So that's certainly one opportunity. Another thing that we've looked at as a team um, that we understand is wrought with challenges is relocate the post office out of downtown and start to think about how this site right here between Washington and Jefferson could become a more focal or focused um, place for development either as private development, commercial development, or as some sort of municipal property. And so I'm going to talk about three different concepts 
Um, but I want you to be thinking um, about the fact that we know the challenges associated with trying to develop on a site owned by the U.S. government that may have no desire whatsoever to relocate the facility out of downtown. What I think is prudent here is that we look at these with the idea that, especially with the post office, we don't know what their future plans are. We haven't yet spoke specifically with the postmaster and to see what they know, but keep in mind with the government, they are consolidating, they're trying to get the U.S. Postal Service to not have a deficit every year um, and run it more like a business, which may mean at any time their operations here could change, downsize, who knows. So I guess even if they were not to <clears throat> abandon or look for another facility or consolidate immediately, I think it is prudent that the city look at if something, if that was to open up and if that opportunity was to open up, what would be our play? I'd just say a couple quick things. Um, as far as, so I sit on the board, uh, AMF, which recently just took over the, uh, the Memorial Auditorium and its operation, or about to take over the operation. And I'll tell you, a lot of things that, that's in the works right now are going to really maximize the ability of that building, uh, which is going to create more of that demand for the hotel motel space in the downtown area. And you had mentioned creating hotel motels above It's always prudent. <laughs> We're doing this in Cedar Rapids, and we've looked at it in more and in water too. Because but the reason is, is because we get backup, so we get a failure of the pumps to yeah. like yeah. like get the water over the wall. We had that in 2008 in Waterloo, where they already had a wall, but we still had problems. Now, so to, to your point, agree, though, though, if the development horizon on this is years past the completion <clears throat> of the flood wall, and it's never failed then there's a certain comfort level associated with knowing your flood protection sure. system is working and I go ahead and develop right that, down. That will actually go around. So yeah. I've got, I've got the question I have is that the Moral Auditorium is like the biggest piece of concrete you'll ever find in your life. Why couldn't you build a hotel on top of it? Uh, and have some great views all the way up and down the river. So I would say structurally the, the one thing that you couldn't do on top of Moral Auditorium is drive columns down through the middle of that roof through all of your event space that you would need really to support everything that's going on up above. The now, can you span it and carry all those loads down on the four sides of that building? Absolutely, but the structural requirements of that are ridiculous um, in terms of their scale and their expense. If you were so, to span it. If you were to span it. Right. Yeah. I have a question. What is, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what is our need, what is going to be the need for a convention It's my understanding that the school district is currently working towards either a joint or new facility that would accommodate the, this, those sorts of uses. There, the, we, there, would, there, would have, there, would, there would have to be an alternative for yeah. those events is, is the answer to that question. What that alternative is exactly, we don't know. There would need to be an alternative. One of the alternatives might be a um, coordinated effort with the school district to produce a facility that is multifunctional, not just for the school but also for those municipal functions. What type of audience do those events get? I mean, could the Capitol Theater not handle that with no. one or more no. shows? No. If they had more than one show, if they had two nights? It's a, it's a great question. I just think it's going to be best answered over the next couple of years. When you guys are running. So yeah. is your contract three years? Three-year contract? My question is, is so much larger. Yeah. I mean, the orchestra itself doesn't fit well. Yeah. They can get on that stage. Yeah. These are important we're questions because uh, culturally, these are some of the things you do not want to lose Burlington. in a exactly. community like this. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we going to ask so so the conversations that have been had to, to prior to this meeting right. have been? Yeah. And, and part of that is not successful. When you look at the, the plan that was developed by 
from our predecessors here, they had anticipated parking expansion to the south. So another you know, reason that build about that is to maintain parking flows. So I think I think I don't know. I mean, I don't speak for Mike and Mike To a downtown that doesn't include the Memorial Auditorium. Right. Or to a to downtown. It includes it, but not, it includes it as it is now. <laughs> Say that one more time. She does, she's saying we don't even dive into the discussion to convert it to a convention center space at this point. We're correct? Am I correct. interpreting you right? Okay. Yeah. So we would lose all that potential revenue for yeah. 10 yeah. nights a week? Yeah. So a yeah, month? I'm, 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 I'm a year? interested in having Ten. that conversation. Yeah. I mean, and so again, I'm, again, Merit, pardon me. But I think in order to have that conversation, we need to be real creative and and have some foresight into where we're going to put these, these venues. Are, are important. No I question. Having this conversation means they're going to fail. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think if they're successful, we're still going to have to have a conversation. So, so AMF would still essentially be in charge of that building. The conversation is only how much investment does the city want to make in the improvement of the building. So. I, okay. I, I, under, okay, I understand, yeah, but also then, when I, when I, when I, I guess when I think convention center, I think wide open space, correct? Which is today. So today. Yeah. Well, so today. you're approving that, correct? Yeah, yeah. what you're, yeah. What you're possibly taking, multi -story. taking uh, possibly multi-story. I'm thinking of like going to see like a concert or yeah. a show or something, and there's that theater seating. Uh, I'm with you, Do you know Susan, because When I sit in that, and I went to a group, a presentation here not too long ago, it's got a proscenium, it's got a stage, it's set up for an auditorium. It just may not be exactly right. But we have convention space in town. So, but I also see the beauty of having a convention and a hotel downtown, because I think that's the, the, the spark it takes to get this all going. I don't know how it works, and I think, I think the conversation has to continue, but we can't lose a cultural community that we really don't have a to me, there's there's an event center and then there's a convention center. Yep. There are two different types of facilities. Correct. We have a lot of event centers, but we have a true convention center. But we don't have any event centers that contain the events that take place in that building. I would agree. So it's right. like this, ah, uh, we're like tug of war and yeah. what do we... So a couple ways to think about that long term. Um, and oh, I do. I do. The success that other communities have had are looking at this and saying, here are the opportunities that exist now. Here's what is simply a programming issue. How many events can we get that fit this existing facility that has all of this unique capability and is an icon within the community? And if we add new facilities that provide a pertinent, complementary space but have a different function, What's the impact that those facilities then have on this existing building and what we do here? And so what I'm hearing the group say is, we love the idea about having convention, a convention space downtown, but we don't want to lose things that Memorial Auditorium provides, right? So well, it's the, on, it's the only it's the only place that we've got that size that can provide right. So and um, so what I'm suggesting is if we develop new properties in downtown that complement what's happening at Vets or at Memorial Auditorium and with what's going to happen and the energy that a new riverfront is going to bring to downtown, that it's going to be a lot easier for your group to program right. that building and to have more events. Right. I so think, I think Shane put it right on. It's great to have a conversation today, but we don't know if the board did move forward with any type sure. of that kind of issue until after AMF has had the opportunity to prove the work of the building. Right. So, let's look at, let's look to that end, we've got ideas. Do you, man? All right. I mean, if AMF is brought, you're going to bring people in to go to the program, they're not going to have anywhere to go. Right. You're not going to have anywhere to stay if you become that popular. So, we've that's what we got to that's 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 tell on okay, Saturday, too. We've got, we've got three op opportunities to share. I've got to go. I'd love to see some of those. Okay. So we'll, we'll make sure you get a hard copy of this um, in the next week okay. so that you can look at it. And then if you've got questions, 
we're here. But you've got one on the next slide, though, right? I mean, you're you're dangling the carrot. I've got right. I've got three <laughs> things to talk about, and I just want to preface this with saying that they're iterative. There's some interchangeability in some of these ideas. If something's here that needs to be here and it's not there, we can move parts and pieces of this around. So don't take them as hard and fast. This has got to be the way that this option is. Well, let's talk about the key components. So in this first idea, ah, wrong buttons. I'm giving away the glory here. All right, slow down, breathe. Here we go. First option, let's imagine that the post office doesn't need to be downtown and we've got this vacant site here and we want to do something on it. What do we do? Well, let's build a hotel and convention center on the post office site with great river views right in the heart of downtown that has direct connection to this great new riverfront and also feeds what's going on at Memorial Auditorium and preserves all of this space in the south which is developed as a part of the riverfront plan for parking. Okay, that's option one. We can figure out the sizing of this building and the footprint and how it works looking west, what looks working east. But the idea is this is a pretty good development site from a hotel convention center perspective. It puts a large group of people in immediate adjacency to the riverfront, and that's good for downtown business. That's one. It's a little different look at it. We've got paper copies of that to draw on if we don't like what we're seeing here. Two. Let's imagine that the post office stays away, still. But we don't want to put a hotel and convention complex on that site. We want to extend the riverfront a little farther up into our downtown. What do you do in that green space? Anybody know the answer? Splash. Mayor's is just like, I'm ready, I got the answer. <laughs> you develop a, a signature family recreation play space like Maggie Daly Park in Chicago. Because right now what the riverfront lacks is place for parents with kids to come down here and hang out for several hours in the morning and drink coffee and play. It's something really fun along the riverfront. Okay? If you want to put a splash pad in there, that opportunity exists. Okay? That would be a good site for it. But you still want a hotel and convention center? Well, we talk about that parking area to the south that we discussed as an opportunity in the first slide, and you put your hotel and convention closer to the river and orient it so that it visually connects to the north and the development that's occurred there along the riverfront overlooks Memorial Auditorium and you try to preserve that parking below that thing and develop that property right there at River's Edge. Okay, So whether it's on the post office site or to the south, Memorial stays where it's at and it's a pretty cool opportunity for some development sites along the river. All kinds of exigent requirements to make something like this happen but from a planning perspective long term, big opportunity. Can I go backwards? No. Okay. So op option number three. Again, remember these are all kind of interchangeable. What if Memorial Auditorium wasn't here? Then what if it wasn't? What if it wasn't? <laughs> you stay with this hand. Down, right? If it wasn't here, what do you do with that? It's not a big enough footprint to develop a new property. Okay? So in our minds, it's an extension of that riverfront development. It becomes more green space, but it's developed as that signature family recreation and play area along the riverfront that complements everything else that's been done. Splash pad, no splash pad doesn't make a difference. As long as families can come down here and hang out and parents have a place to watch their kids play next to the river, it's going to be successful. Okay, Because it's in the heart of downtown, and it's that thing that's drawing Everybody that lives out west into downtown um, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning for coffee, a couple of coffee shops nearby, parents got the caffeine, the kids are playing in the park, it works. They've proved it in Chicago and communities all over the country that if you build downtown playgrounds, really cool ones, families come. Okay. So those are your really immediate opportunities on this site. Bear in mind, we didn't project this riverfront idea much farther beyond these blocks, but this is where we see the opportunity happening. Now, the continuation of this discussion is all around this area, huge potential for redevelopment in the long term. But if we're just looking at what can we do in the near term to catalyze development in downtown, 
these are three pretty, what we think are pretty good solid ideas in interesting locations that there's already been interest and momentum generated that you can start to capitalize on um, and really move this thing forward. All right, what do we think of the options? Is there anything you heard there that is just absolutely unconscionable? Do you have ideas about what you'd like to see that we didn't discuss yet? Well, you're making it easy. <laughs> well, you've hit, on, you've hit on some very important areas that, are, that it need a lot of attention. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to get ready to run, but just, just from my perspective, you guys are in my wheelhouse, man. So, uh, well done, well done. But yeah, I'm totally deal. And Chuck, you were on tonight, my friend. <laughs> I, I think one of the biggest complaints I, I hear from people who come into town is there's no way to get onto the river. Right. That's right. And this doesn't seem to give any options to assist with that. JJR's. Yeah. Their plan's got the boardwalk. Yeah. It's a 300 foot by 20. No, uh, literally on the uh, on the water. So I don't have I don't have the full image of this. I'm still a little trigger happy. Uh, but this boardwalk was imagined as one a boardwalk with two a docking facility potentially. But what you don't see in this image is uh, to the south of Memorial here. There's that whole parking facility and a number of different boat ramps and access points down here that are intended to get people right down to the water. As well as the north. As well as the north of beyond, yes. So that floating boardwalk, I think that, for me, yeah. that was the most exciting thing about the riverfront besides the flood wall, and, uh, because you can go out and walk on the river. The reason we put that there is just to make, give people the opportunity to actually experience the river. I mean, keep in mind too that the market analysis also also pointed to much to, to a um, very good potential for increased residential living downtown. Um, a lot of this may occur in what we're calling the warehouse district. Um, There's may, lots of opportunities. Yeah, lots of opportunities. And so what, what we're thinking about is over over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, uh, 20 years, um, as a, as more people are living downtown, which is not unusual anymore. It is happening all over the country. And as people are doing that, that the green space along the riverfront becomes that much more critical to the enjoyment of the overall living experience downtown. Mm -hmm. And we have limited <laughs> we have limited real estate down there. <laughs> limited real estate for that. So I wanted to ask the question, how many of you are not familiar with Maggie Daly Park in Chicago? Okay. Um, downtown Chicago, Michigan Avenue, the Bean is right back here under these trees. This is the Prisker Pavilion. And this used to be Grant Park, the north end of Grant Park. And several years ago, um, they developed it into Maggie Daly Park, which is the premier family fun center in the country. Um, there's a number of different things that happen here. This bridge is the Frank Gary Serpentine Bridge that connects the Pritzker Pavilion to the park. You come down here, there's this awesome children's play area that has multiple age group play spaces um, defined. And then um, there's a rock climbing facility, outdoor rock climbing facility with an ice loop around it. So in the wintertime, they refrigerate this loop and you can skate on that plaza and that's what you're seeing here. Um, very popular. And then, um, let's see if I've got some better shots here. So this is just one look at one of the, this is the sort of the older kids play area. It's towers. These climbing towers are about five stories tall. Um, all net climbing up on the inside, suspension bridge, slides coming down. And my kids have played there several <coughs> times and absolutely love it. Uh, hillsides, and what's really cool about it is it's not just a 
playground and play surfaces, but if there's a landscape there too. So they're bringing vegetation into downtown and really celebrating this as um, a play environment as opposed to just a, a playground. And another little overview of it. Now, it's a big footprint in comparison to the space that we have available in downtown Burlington, um, but a scaled version of this to your community um, could be super, super successful. I mean, a destination can draw more people than just right. Burlington oh, businesses. Yeah. Right. So, this is what we think is a key component that's currently missing from the riverfront plan, and we'd like to see something like that happen down here. Yeah. I'm writing that one down. Eric, comments? Um, I am um, So yes. next steps from a catalyst site development standpoint, um, hearing a few objections, we're going to take these basic ideas and, and really develop the graphics a little bit more so that we can create a set of compelling images that can be used for um, generating excitement within the community, potentially for fundraising in the future, but something that, that really nicely defines the image and potential. And if, if you remember looking through Smith Group, JJR's plan for the riverfront, they provided a lot of that kind of stuff as a part of their plan, and that's really what we need to do with this, is to take these ideas to that next step so that um, it doesn't require an hour and 15 minutes to explain them all, that somebody can look at it and go, I love what I'm seeing there, yes, let's do that, I'll give money to that. Sounds good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you all for your input. Thank you. Let me ask you a question. It's actually more personal. Uh, my husband. Yeah, I'll